Love it. Can you say hi? Hi. Can you say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Give a kiss. Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning. This episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Crime Army and thank you so much for tuning in again. I am your host Margot and this is a true crime podcast that focuses on murders committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen. I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. How's everyone doing? Are you surviving the coronavirus crazy times? Listen, I just can't get over it. I usually stock up on toilet paper and dish soap and all that jazz, but walking into a grocery store and seeing entire aisles of empty shelves is freaking frightening. All right, no more about coronavirus. Before I begin, I have two shout outs to give. We have two producers this week, ladies who have donated to the Military Murder Morale Fund. First, I need to give a shout out to my girl Brianna from Sutton Knits on Instagram. She's been in the true crime army almost from the beginning, and I highly recommend that you go check out her beautiful handmade, crocheted, and knitted creations. She always has pictures of her crafty little adorable blankets with little babies on her Instagram, and it's so cute. So today, while you're scrolling on Instagram, taking part in this social distancing, don't forget to check out Sutton Knits on Instagram, okay? And our second producer this week is an international true crime army member, Joe from New Zealand. Yes, can you believe that? Because if you're just tuning in, military murder is no joke. We have listeners in over 120 countries. And thanks to Joe, I know that the True Crime Army is alive and kicking all over the world. And thank you so much, Joe, for listening all the way from New Zealand. And I hope that you're keeping safe out there. All right. Welcome to part two of my three-part series on the serial killer BTK. If you haven't already listened to part one, which is episode 21, please stop and go back. It's very important that you listen to part one or you're going to be lost. And stay tuned to the very end of part two, because if you're listening to this before part three comes out, I have a special announcement and a way that you can get part three today. Last week, I left off right when the police were about to respond to the Otero family murder scene after the three older kids found their parents. And that's where I will pick up. Now, let's keep digging. My sources for this episode are the same as last week, but I like to add a few, including articles by the Wichita Eagle, the Dallas Morning News, Court Transcripts, Reader's Digest, New York Times, and Time Magazine. Okay, guys, before I begin today, I just want to give another warning. This episode is very, very graphic, so please don't let your kids listen, and listener discretion is highly, highly encouraged. We pick up when the Otero neighbor called the police, and the three kids were reeling from their parents' death. Charlie, the oldest son, sent Carmen to head to the school in an attempt to stop little Joseph and Josephine from coming home to this horror. What Charlie hadn't realized was that his younger siblings were also dead. Paramedics were the first on scene, but they couldn't enter the home without the police securing the premises. And the kids cried and begged the paramedics to please come inside, please. I need you guys to help my parents. But the paramedics had to follow protocol. The police arrived, they walk in, and they find the scene didn't really match the scene of a murder-suicide. First, why was Joseph tied to the bed? And then they noticed that the dressers were opened and looked as if they had been rummaged through. And as they walked from room to room, they discovered Joseph Jr. Near the living room, they found the contents of Julie's purse on the floor. Then the cops continued clearing the house, and they quickly discovered a basement. A cop went down there and it was dark and he had a hard time finding the light switch, so he used his flashlight to navigate his way. He noticed that the basement was the man cave because he saw in a distance, he saw a table with model airplanes on it. 
He continued making his way through the basement when he bumped something with his shoulder. He flashed the flashlight up and that's when he discovered little Josephine dead. What a scene. Guys, this is not only sad, but truly horrifying. I am sure that the cop who made that discovery has suffered a lot throughout his life because how do you unsee this? Josephine was wearing a little training bra that had been cut, exposing one of her tiny breasts. She had been tied like a prisoner. Her hands were tied behind her back and then attached to a cord around her waist. This scene created a sense of urgency in the police department. They had to get this murderer off the street. They started by interviewing the neighbors. I mean, there was no way that an entire family could be eliminated without anyone seeing or hearing anything in broad daylight. One witness recalled that at 10.30 a.m., they saw the family car back out of the driveway, driven by a Middle Eastern looking guy. Someone else saw a dark haired stranger quickly backing out of the Otero driveway. Yet another neighbor also saw a car quickly backing out of the driveway, so quick, in fact, that the neighbor almost crashed into that car. Later that day, police found the Otero family car in the mall parking lot, but it was 1974 and without surveillance cameras, the car didn't reveal any helpful clues. Investigators quickly discovered that the family was new in town. They had moved into the area in the fall of 1973, having recently moved in from Panama. Joseph Otero Sr. had recently retired from the Air Force, and he was now working as a mechanic and a flight instructor. Joseph and Julie married when she was just 18 years old, and they had been married for 16 years. Within a week of the murders, the local newspaper set up a secret witness program, and the paper raised $7,500 as a reward, and that's close to $40,000 in today's value. The investigators interviewed close to 1,000 people, but came up with nothing. They were grasping for straws, but it was hard to believe that four members of a family would be taken out as a random act of violence. So they started looking closer to home. This crime seemed very personal and the investigators wondered if the hit was connected to the drug trade. According to John Douglas's book, the chief of police and the chief of homicide took a trip to Puerto Rico and then a trip to Panama to interview some folks and see if this was a drug kill. But they got nothing. Go figure. Meanwhile, Dennis was living his life in fear. However, days, weeks, and months went by, and the cops didn't show up at Dennis's house. He began to realize he might have actually gotten away with a quadruple murder. And then he got the itch to kill again. In March of 1974, Dennis locked in on his next project, a young, blonde, 21-year-old woman named Catherine Bright. She lived at 3217 East 13th Street North. One day, Dennis went to her house and pounded on the door, but she wasn't home, and so he left. But he wasn't letting up on her. So he began to plan. On April 4th, 1974, Dennis decided it was time. At around noon, he drove by the house and saw the girl's car in the driveway. He thought, great. He parked a few blocks away and walked to the house. He walked straight to the backyard and cut the phone line. He then broke into the house by shattering the glass back door. And he was surprised to find the house was empty. I mean, her car was there, but he wasn't. But you know what? He had time. So he decided to wait. While he waited, he actually swept up the glass from the door that he had just shattered and left it in a neat little pile on the floor. Then, all of a sudden, the front door swung open and in walked a 19-year-old man. It was Catherine's younger brother, Kevin. Again, Dennis was shocked. What in the world? Another man? Now, Dennis brandished his gun and just then, Catherine walked in. Dennis then told the same sob story that he told the Oteros. He was an escaped convict. He needed food, money, and a car. Catherine told him to beat it, but he said, I'm serious, and he ordered Catherine and Kevin to the back room. It was evident that Dennis had been there a while because laid on the bed were the contents of his hit kit. He told Kevin to tie Catherine to the chair and Kevin obliged. Then he told Kevin to lay on the floor and he quickly tied his hands and legs with a pair of jeans and stockings. Then, Dennis placed a pillow under Kevin's head. Once they were both secured, he told Catherine to walk into the other room, and she was able to do this even though she was tied to the chair. At that moment, Dennis did what he did best. He began to panic. 
he rummaged through the house looking for something and returned first to Kevin because, you know, Kevin was just collateral damage. He wrapped something around Kevin's neck and pulled tight. Kevin was squirming from instinct and he was so stringy that he actually got his hands loose and turned to face Dennis. Oh, shoot. Dennis was shocked. Now what? Dennis remembered the pistol that he had hidden in his waistband and he grabbed it, took aim at Kevin's head and pulled the trigger. The bullet hit Kevin in the head and he went down. He was out. But within a few seconds or minutes, Kevin, by this point a bloody mess, miraculously opened his eyes. But when he looked, Dennis was gone. After shooting Kevin, Dennis had turned his attention to Catherine in the next room. She was his intended target after all. When Kevin opened his eyes, he heard Kathy screaming, you killed my brother. But Dennis assured him, I didn't kill him. I just injured him. But he was full of crap. He thought Kevin was dead. Little did he know that Kevin was scrawny, but he was about to give him a run for his money. In the next room, Kevin jumped up and untied his feet. He was so loud that Dennis heard him and Kevin was again face to face with a killer. Kevin lunged at Dennis and got hold of the gun and he put the gun in Dennis's chest and pulled the trigger, but it didn't fire. Crap! Kevin pulled the trigger again, but Dennis diverted the bullet again. Kevin pulled a third time and the gun didn't fire. Dennis finally yanked the gun out of Kevin's head. He took aim straight center of Kevin's face and pulled the trigger. Kevin went down like a log and Dennis had to ensure that he was dead. So he jumped on Kevin's back and strangled him with a rope to make sure that he was dead. But he didn't have much time because Kathy was screaming like a maniac from the next room. So Dennis had to attend to her. Dennis got to Kathy and in his panic to shut her up, it was daytime. Remember, he began to stab her. And while he stabbed her, he heard the front door swing open. Dennis quickly walked over to Kevin and realized Kevin was gone. He had just run out the front door. Dennis didn't have time. He knew the cops would be there any minute. What Dennis could not have ever imagined was that when he shot Kevin point blank in the face, the bullet ripped through Kevin's lip and was deflected by his front teeth. He was unconscious for a few minutes. And when he came to and heard Kathy screaming, he realized the only way to help his sister was to run to get police. Kevin escaped through the front door and ran in the street. Just then, the passerby scooped him up in the car and got to a location to call police. The police officer arrived at the house announcing himself, It's the police! And when he reached Catherine, she was still alive. She was lying on her side with the phone in her hand. And all she could whisper was, Help me, I can't breathe. She had been stabbed 11 times and every single one of her major organs had been sliced. Her lungs had been punctured and she was slowly suffocating. She was whisked off to the hospital where she died five hours later on the operating table. At this point, Kevin was also in the hospital and he was eager to tell police everything he could remember. He said the man was close to six feet tall, had kind of like a dad bod, total pot belly, dark hair, and a thick, dark mustache. He said the man was about 25 years old. He was wearing a stocking cap, gloves, a white t-shirt, a green parka, and had a pistol. And you know what? Kevin's description was pretty spot on. Dennis Rader was 29 years old at the time of the murder. He had a mustache and a pot belly, and he was wearing his infamous Air Force parka. But Kevin had been shot in the head and in the face, and the cops thought his identification of the killer was not reliable. Ugh, and this just makes me so sad because Kevin was pretty spot on. Back at the crime scene, it was void of fingerprints or any sign of the killer. The cops did find a dime-sized amount of marijuana and briefly considered the murder was drug-related. Ugh, but quickly ruled it out when Catherine's roommate, who was also her sister, admitted that they were recreational pot smokers. And soon, the trail went cold. It would be years before police would connect the Otero family murders and Kathy's murder to the same killer. The Oteros had all been strangled, yet Kevin had been shot and strangled, and Kathy had been stabbed. So for now, it was just two random home invasions. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. 
Rituals multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. In October of 1974, the police thought they got a break when they were interrogating a local sex offender named Gary Sebring. By the way, this Gary guy is so sick. His prior sex offense was that he had sex with a duck at a park. Ugh, gross. Long story. I'm not getting into it. Anyway, in October of 74, Gary was being interrogated because he was suspected of molesting a five-year-old girl. During the interrogation, he made this off-the-cuff comment about the Oteros. Basically, something to the effect of, if I did it, this is how I would have done it. I would have been there with my brother and my other buddy, and we would have tied everyone up. And the investigators were kind of like, what in the world? Is it possible? Now, the cops didn't really think that this Gary guy was smart enough to pull off a quadruple murder, but it was protocol to run down the lead. Of course, the media got wind of some dude alleging that he committed the Otero murders, and they published an article about these three clowns and the Otero family murders. Well, Dennis Lynn Rader was an avid newspaper reader, and he was not too keen on someone else taking credit for his work. So what did he do? You guessed it. On October 22nd, 1974, Dennis called the Otero murder hotline and said, quote, listen and listen good because I'm not going to repeat myself. The real Otero family killer put a letter inside a mechanical engineering book on the second floor of the library, end quote. This was a pretty serious allegation, and soon the investigators were at the library looking for the clue. This is some real hunt-a-killers type stuff, guys. Well, sure enough, they found an envelope in a mechanical engineering book that said Bill Thomas Kilman on the outside. Inside the envelope was a lengthy typer in letter with a lot of misspellings and grammatical mistakes. The letter said, quote, Otero case, I write this letter to you for the sake of the taxpayer as well as your time. Those three dudes that you have in custody are just talking to get publicity for the Otero murders. They know nothing at all. I did it by myself and no one's help. There has been no talk either. Let's put it straight, end quote. Then he went on to detail exactly how each deceased member of the Otero family was dressed, how they were killed, the position in which he left their bodies, and comments for the detectives. He said, quote, I'm sorry this happened to society. They are the ones who suffer the most. It's hard to control myself. You probably call me psychotic with sexual perversion hang up. When this monster enter my brain, I will never know. But it's here to stay, end quote. He ended by saying his code name. It would be bind them, torture them, kill them, BTK. After reading the letter, they knew this was the actual killer. He was so meticulous in his description of the crime and how each Otero family member had been left. But now what? Again, the letter had no fingerprints on it. There was no surveillance at the library. And then the case went cold. Dennis then went underground for three years, but he didn't just go underground by choice. He went underground because he and Paula had their first baby in July of 1974, a son named Brian. And during this time, Dennis got a job working for ADT installing home security systems. Isn't that crazy? This killer, he killed five people and he was working for ADT. I think it's 
absolutely insane. But you know what? Dennis wasn't done killing. He was just preoccupied for the time being. But in 1976, he got the itch to kill again, and he was looking for easy targets. So he went around town looking for cars or trailers with for sale signs. This made it easy for him to call the owner, pay them a visit, and scope out the place without breaking in. And one day, he found the perfect victim, a single mom selling a trailer, and he called her Project Coleman. On August 11th, 1976, he packed up his hit kit early in the morning, parked nearby, and walked to Project Coleman's house. As he was approaching the house, police sirens started going off in the distance, and they got closer and closer. Dennis was like, oh crap, I don't know what this is, but I'm getting out of here, and he quickly scurried away. Later, he would find out that a sniper by the name of Michael Souls had opened fire from the 26th floor of the Holiday Inn in downtown Wichita. That guy killed three people and injured 11 others, causing 11 minutes of pure terror in Wichita. Project Coleman would never know this, but that sniper saved her life. The following year, in March of 77, Dennis started to get the urge again. He used to frequent the bars, and one day he saw her, the lady he wanted to kill. That night, he followed her home after she left the bar, and from that day on, he began to stalk her. Again, he was stalking to check her routine and to look for signs of a man. Well, on March 17th, 1977, he decided today is the day. It was mid-morning when people were up and about and doing their thing, and he walked right up to the woman's house and knocked. And then he rang the doorbell, but she didn't answer. Meanwhile, earlier that morning, a neighbor of the woman that Dennis was stalking decided to keep her three kids home from school that day because she wasn't feeling well. This neighbor was 24-year-old Shirley Vianne. Shirley lived at 1311 South Hydraulic Street with her husband Rick and her three kids, eight-year-old Bud, five-year-old Steve, and four-year-old Stephanie. On this day, Rick was working his construction job and Shirley decided to keep the kids home because, like I said, she wasn't feeling well. Well, sometime in the late morning, she needed something like a home remedy. And so she sent her five-year-old son, Steve, to the local market to get her some soup and two $40 money orders. And are you horrified that a five-year-old could go to a grocery store by themselves? Well, you know, don't be. It was the 70s and back then no one would bat an eye. But Shirley was cautious. And so before she sent Steve on his way, she called them and said, hey, my son's coming to the store to buy a few things. Please keep an eye out for him. Well, Steve made it to the store without incident. And on his way home, a man approached him, showed him a picture of a lady and a little boy and said, hey, have you seen these people? Well, the little boy got close to the picture. Nope, he didn't recognize them. And then Steve continued walking and went inside the house. Well, Steve walked into his house. Oh, cartoons. He put everything on the table and sat on the couch to watch cartoons with his siblings. It was about 10 minutes later when someone knocked on the door. Steve sprung up from the couch to check who it was and he opened the door and it was the man with the picture. It was Dennis Rader. You see, Dennis had been stalking Steve's neighbor. She was the woman from the bar. And today was the day that he had chosen. But when Dennis went to her house, she wasn't home. So he pivoted and decided this house would have to do to scratch his itch to kill. After Steve opened the door, he looked at Dennis and Dennis said he was looking for a dog. And Steve said, no, I haven't seen a dog. But the man didn't let up. He said, hey, is your mother home? Let me ask her. Maybe she's seen the dog. And then Dennis walked right into the house, closed the door behind him and closed the blinds in the living room. The three kids sat there mesmerized by this stranger in their home. And then Dennis pulled out the gun and the kids began to panic. Dennis yelled, where is your mother? And then Shirley, she heard all this commotion and she darted out of the bedroom demanding to know who in the hell he was and why he was in her house. But Dennis told her, you shut up and go back in your room. And then he proceeded to follow her. Just then, don't you dare touch the phone. Just then, Shirley asked Dennis if she could smoke a cigarette. And he allowed it, probably in an attempt to de-escalate the situation and to gain Shirley's trust. Once she was done with her cigarette, Dennis tried to tie the kids up, but they just wailed. Dennis didn't know what to do, so he told Shirley to grab some blankets, some toys, anything to keep the kids entertained. And then he locked the kids in the bathroom. 
the kids were horrified. But if you've ever tried to keep a crying kid from crying, you know there is no stopping them. Steve, the five-year-old, kept screaming and Dennis threatened the young boy. So, of course, Shirley didn't want her kids to get hurt. So she pled from outside the bathroom door. Please, guys, please just just be quiet for mommy, okay? When Dennis was finally alone with Shirley, sick excitement crept inside him. Yes, it had been close to three years since his last kill and he had been itching for this moment. He made Shirley get naked and then he tied her hands and her feet. And as he was doing this, she leaned over the bed and threw up. Little did she know she was on borrowed time. But again, Dennis allowed her to believe that he was a nice criminal. So after she threw up, he got her a glass of water. Suddenly, the phone rang again, and Dennis knew he had little time before whoever kept calling would show up at the house. So he pulled a cord around Shirley's neck, and he pulled and pulled and pulled. All the while, she fought for her life, realizing that she was wrong about him. Sick Dennis masturbated into her nightgown. Once she stopped moving, he wrapped a plastic bag around her head and tied it tight. Then he left. He'd later admit wishing he had more time to kill the three kids. Once the kids heard Shirley struggling, they began to get hysterical again. And eventually one of the boys had broken a window in the bathroom and jumped outside to run for help. The other little boy got enough strength to push the door just enough to squeeze through the gap. And that is when he discovered his mother she was dead. The neighbor quickly came over and discovered Shirley's dead body. She was tied to the bedpost, but her body was still warm. The paramedics arrived just before 1 p.m. and because it was dark in the room, they brought her body to the living room and attempted to provide CPR, but she was too far gone. The police arrived and they didn't have the benefit of seeing an undisturbed crime scene, so they had to rely on the memory of the paramedics, the neighbor, and the three young kids. The first thing they noticed was that Shirley hadn't been sexually assaulted, even though she was naked, and she didn't have any signs of defensive wounds. The kids described the man as dark-haired, late 30s, 40s, and heavy built. And remember those two money orders that Steve had picked up from the store? They were gone. The cops didn't have much to go on, so although Shirley hadn't been raped, the murder was ruled a sex crime. And since the phone line hadn't been cut, The police didn't think that this was the work of BTK. And in plus, BTK had been silent for three years, so they had no idea that it could be him. And the case went cold. It wouldn't be long until Dennis struck again. And this time, according to him, he found the perfect victim. Remember how his first six victims had all been attacked in the middle of the day? Well, this time, Dennis decided to strike at night. This time, it was Project Foxtail. It was Nancy Fox. She was a 25-year-old jewelry assistant manager at the local mall. He began stalking her in November of 77. He first spotted her leaving her house, and when she wasn't home, he began rummaging through her mail, and he learned her name and that she worked at the mall. One day, unbeknownst to Nancy, Dennis paid her a visit at the store, and he watched her closely while she worked. But he just appeared to be a normal patron because he always just fit in. And before he left, he bought a piece of jewelry. It was December 8th, 1977, and Dennis told his wife that he had to work on a college paper. So he left his house after dark. And this was a perfect ploy because he knew that he could return after his wife was asleep and she'd have no clue. Dennis knew Nancy's schedule because he had been stalking her. So he got to her house when she wasn't there. He cut her phone line, shattered a window to gain entry into her house, and just waited. Nancy had no idea the fate that awaited her. She left her job at the mall around 9 p.m. and then stopped to get some fast food through the drive-thru, and then she went home where she lived alone. She got home around 9.20 p.m., and as soon as she walked in through her front door, he quickly told her, Don't move. I have a gun and a knife. I'm only here to rape you. Nancy was dumbfounded, but as she stared at him, she took out a cigarette, she lit it, and she smoked. And then she started a conversation with him. She really wanted to know, why are you doing this? Why me? But little did Nancy know that he wasn't there for rape. She asked him if she could use the bathroom and he allowed it. And when she got out of the bathroom, Dennis was wearing gloves. And this really spooked her even further than she was already spooked, thinking she was going to get raped. 
But you know, Dennis downplayed it. Hey, 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 I'm just putting these on because I don't want to leave any fingerprints. He then forced her on the bed, lowered her pants and her undies and tied her up and gagged her. Then he placed a belt around her neck. And just then, Nancy realized he was going to kill her. By this point, Dennis's pants were down and Nancy's instincts kicked in as he pulled the belt around her neck and she grabbed his scrotum with all her might. But instead of pain, Dennis felt pleasure and sadly, Dennis tortured Nancy just as he had done to the animals he tortured in his youth. He would tighten the belt around her neck just enough to cause her to lose consciousness and then when she would come to again, he'd do it all over again. It was then during this torture that Dennis confessed his other murders to Nancy and then he snuffed out her life. He eventually ejaculated into a nightgown that he left behind at the scene and before he left, he grabbed her driver's license and he turned up the heat. The next morning, Dennis woke up and he grabbed the paper. He scurried through the newspaper expecting to see something in there about Nancy's murder but he was disappointed when his horrific crime wasn't featured anywhere. So he realized, crap, Project Fox lived alone. It's possible no one found her. That morning, he stepped away from work to use the payphone, and at 8.20 a.m., he dropped in some planes and dialed 911. What is the nature of your emergency? Yes, you will find a homicide Quote, you will find a homicide at 843 South Pershing, Nancy Fox, end quote. Then Dennis walked away from the payphone and left the phone off the hook. Just then, a firefighter picked up the payphone. Hello? Hello? And the police operator was like, uh, did you just see the person who was on the phone? But the firefighter had no clue. The call lasted seven seconds and BTK was seconds from being caught. But like the faceless ghost that Wichita had gotten used to, no one saw him. He had snuck away in the 8 a.m. rush hour. The police arrived at Nancy's house before 8.30 a.m. They saw the shattered window, the unlocked front door, the cut phone line, the contents of Nancy's purse on the coffee table. And in the bedroom, they found Nancy. She was still wearing her sweater, but her underwear was pulled down to her knees. Her hands were tied behind her back and her ankles had been bound by her own nightgown. She had been gagged with stockings and around her neck was a pair of stockings tied tightly. When the police looked around, the contents of her lingerie drawer had been dumped and they found a nightgown with Dennis's semen. But remember, it was 1977 and DNA was a long way away from the technology that we have today. But this piece of evidence would come in handy decades later. Of the crime scene, there were a lot of similarities to the Otero family murder. Murder by strangulation, no signs of rape, semen left behind, a cut phone line, purse content spilled in the main living area, and the heat had been turned up before the perpetrator left. But the police had one thing in Nancy's case that they didn't have before, the killer's voice caught on tape. But it would be months before this audio was released to anyone. And Nancy Fox's murder soon grew cold. On February 10th, 1978, Dennis sent a four-page letter to Cake TV claiming responsibility for the murders of Shirley Vianne, Nancy Fox, and another unnamed victim, presumably Catherine Bright. Of the unnamed victim, he said, quote, you guess the motive and the victim, end quote. The letter included a drawing of a dead woman eerily similar to Nancy Fox. And in the letter, Dennis was pissed that the poem that he had written and delivered to Wichita Eagle, which was a local newspaper a few weeks earlier, had it been published in the paper. He was beside himself like, OK, you guys want to pretend that I don't exist, that you don't have a killer among your citizens. Hello. How many people do I have to kill before I get some airtime? Huh? You guys are so stupid if you think all those murders were not related. A bunch of dead women, all bound with a cut phone line and zero witnesses, except Shirley's kids. Ugh, I really wanted to kill those kids, just like I did with the Otero kids. But a phone call saved their little squirmy lives. But guys, you know, four pages is a lot of territory to cover. So Dennis, the sick perv that he was and still is, wrote about little Josephine and how much he enjoyed killing her. But wait, there was more. 
Dennis introduced police to Factor X. He said, yeah, I'm like the rest of the serial killers. The son of Sam, Jack the Ripper, Harvey Glattman, the Boston Strangler, Dr. H. H. Holmes, the pantyhose strangler of Florida, the hillside strangler, Ted of the West Coast, and many more infamous character kill. What the heck, Dennis? You are the worst name dropper ever. And Dennis wanted everyone to know killing didn't bother him. Not one bit. He could kill and return to life as usual. But the thing was, eventually the urge came back. Dennis mocked the police. I committed these murders and I don't have a lot of time, but you still can't catch me. And that phone thing, yikes, that was a close one. But don't worry, I'll be in touch by letter. You'll know it's me because I'll sign it BTK. And did you know that Dennis was a poet? He wrote a poem titled, O Death to Nancy. It read, quote, What is this that I can see, cold icy hands taking hold of me? For death has come, you all can see. Hell has opened its gate to trick me. O death, O death, can't you spare me over for another year? I'll stuff your jaws till you can't talk. I'll bind your legs till you can't walk. I'll tie your hands till you can't make a stand. And finally, I'll close your eyes so you can't see. I'll bring sexual death unto you for me, end quote. And then Dennis told the cops he needed a nickname and he listed out his top eight choices. Are you ready for these choices? Okay, so they are one This is what he potentially wanted to be known as, even though he had been communicating as BTK for the last couple of years. Anyway, number one, the BTK strangler, two, Wichita strangler, three, the poetic strangler, four, the bondage strangler, five, psycho the Wichita hangman, six, the Wichita executioner, seven, the garrote phantom, and eight, the asphyxiator. Ugh. After this, Cake TV reported the letter to the police and the police called up Wichita Eagle like, what in the heck poem is this guy talking about? As Wichita Eagle scoured their mailroom trying to figure out what they missed, they found it. You see, on January 31st, 1978, two weeks before the current letter, the Wichita Eagle had actually received a poem about Shirley Ryan, but it was written on cue cards, kind of like index cards. So when the mailroom received it, they thought it was an ad and they forwarded it to the advertising department. And it was a poem titled Shirley Locks. And it read, quote, Shirley Locks, Shirley Locks, wilt thou be mine? Thou shalt not scream, not yet feel the line, but law on cushion and think of me and death and how it is going to be, end quote. And at the bottom, he wrote a note, quote, poem for Fox next, end quote. On that same day, February 10th, 1978, the chief of police knew that they had a serial killer on their hands and they needed to alert the public. For the last few years, they hadn't said anything and it was time. The chief of police called a press conference and he told the people of Wichita, listen, we have a person claiming to have killed the Otero family, Shirley Vianne, Nancy Fox, and a seventh person. We need everyone to remain calm, but we need your help. We're putting more beat cops out there and we're creating a task force. And we've set up a phone line where citizens with any information, anything at all, can call directly. Of course, mass hysteria hit hard after this press conference. You say remain calm and everyone does the opposite. But I would be similarly freaking out if there was a serial killer on the loose for many, many years. But True Crime Army, the press conference in 78 caused the same type of hysteria as the coronavirus of 2020 slash 2019, but contained to just Wichita. The stores were wiped clean of essentials like door locks, peepholes, and mace. But the announcement was affecting more than just citizens' buying habits. It was affecting people's daily habits, too. Before people walked through their front door, they would go out back to check if the phone line had been cut. They'd walk in the house and walk straight to the phone and pick it up to hear for a ringtone. The people were panicked, and rightfully so. But even with all of this, Dennis, the family man who worked for ADT, let's not forget, he walked the streets a free man. In June of 1978, the Raiders welcomed their second baby, a little daughter named Carrie, and she was the apple of her father's eye. 
By all accounts, Dennis was a stellar dad. He was the one out back building tree houses and doing the Boy Scout thing and taking his daughter to to go fishing. But even the birth of his kids couldn't contain the killer inside. In the fall of 78, Dennis was at home alone, having one of his little bondage parties where he would dress like a woman, usually wearing something that he stole from one of his victims because he liked to, those were like his glory days. And then he would wear one of those white porcelain doll looking face masks and wigs and and, and all types of crazy things. And he'd tie himself up and then he would wrap a noose around his neck. And then while he was standing, he would lean forward to feel the exhilarating feeling of the rope against his neck, cutting off his circulation, because that was the feeling he liked best, the feeling of being close to death. Well, he was sitting there or standing there or whatever, and in walked Paula. He was mortified, but she was horrified. What in the world had she just walked into? She rushed out of the room, confused beyond belief. But it's the 70s and people didn't really talk about stuff like that. So she just kind of like said nothing. But behind the scenes, she called a local VA hospital and was like, hey, so I have a friend and she's going through some stuff with her husband and blah, 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 blah. And this is what's going on. Are there any books that you can recommend? And well, they recommended some books and I don't know what she said. Well, Paula went out to the store and purchased every single book and then she gave them to Dennis with a stern suggestion. You better memorize all of these books and stop the bull. Yes, ma'am, Dennis thought, but he wasn't going to stop. He was just going to do a better job at hiding. On April 28th, 1979, Dennis decided to kill, and today was as good a day as any. It was dark outside when he broke into a house located at 615 South Pinecrest, but his victim wasn't home. But it's okay. Dennis always had time to wait. So he waited, and he waited, and he waited. And at 10 p.m., he heard a car door slam. Yes, excitement filled his stupid pot belly. His victim was 61-year-old Anna Williams. This woman had been recently widowed, and on this particular night, she had decided to go clubbing with her girlfriends. Okay, it wasn't actually clubbing. It was square dancing, but you know, kind of the same thing. Anyway, Anna had been dropped off by one of her friends, and they waited in the car as Anna made her way to her porch. Her friends kept calling out, Anna, Anna, come on, don't be such an old lady. Let's go for a cup of coffee. And Anna said, no, 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 it's getting far too late. She reached in her purse for her keys. She put the key into the lock and then she put the keys back in her purse. What the heck? One cup of coffee won't kill me. And then she jumped back in the car. Oh my God. Little did Anna know that cup of coffee saved her life. Anna was gone but one hour. And when she got home, she noticed her basement window had been shattered. There was a rope, a broom handle and some underwear by a bedroom located in the basement. And in the main living area, She had several items stolen, including a scarf, some jewelry, clothes, and $35 cash. When she picked up the phone to call the cops, there was no dial tone. I would be freaking the heck out. Well, the police arrive at the house and they look around. They're taking their little notes, but because no one was hurt, they never notified the homicide department. So even though there had been a press conference about the same exact thing a few months earlier, no one put two and two together. But days and weeks would pass and Dennis was getting agitated. He was looking for the news about this break-in in Anna's house. So on June 15th, 1979, roughly six weeks after the break-in, Dennis Lynn, ever the media whore, mailed a package to Anna. This would surely get their attention. And the package contained the missing scarf and jewelry and a hand-drawn picture of a woman laying bound and tied on a bed with a broomstick up her privates. And there was also a poem titled, Oh, Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? And I'm just going to read the first verse. It's kind of a lengthy poem, but this is what it says. Quote, "'Twas perfect plan of deviant pleasure, so bold on this spring night, my inner feeling hot with propension of the new awakening season, worn wet with inner fear and rapture, my pleasure of entanglement like new vines at night. Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? End quote. Ah, Now, thankfully, the package was intercepted by Anna's daughter, but quickly reported to police. At this point, the police were running around like chickens with their heads cut off, just like Dennis liked it. 
But how in the world were police ever going to catch this guy? Well, on August 15, 1979, the police finally decided to publicly release that seven-second audio of his 911 call, the one that he made the morning after Nancy Fox's murder. And the audio was played over and over and over again in an effort that if somebody, anybody, recognized the voice, even though it was only seven seconds, that they would come forward. And that same day, they received 100 tips. That day, Dennis was sitting at home watching the news and his wife was walking around the house doing chores, but she was still listening to the TV in the background as us moms are usually pretty awesome at multitasking. When Paula heard the seven second call for the umpteenth time on the news, she laughed and she looked at Dennis and said, huh, he sounds just like you. And that wraps up part two of my series on BTK. I know. Everyone's probably biting their nails. And for the people who already know this story, they know what's going to happen. But it's pretty freaking crazy. All right. Don't forget to join me next week where I will bring you the conclusion of the BTK story. And stay tuned because he's not done killing yet. But guess what? I have a surprise for you. You don't have to wait a week to get part three. Just join my True Crime Army Bulletin and you can get part three ad free and within 24 hours of signing up. Yep, you can get it before next week so you don't have to wait anymore. The True Crime Army Bulletin is just a way for me to communicate with you outside of the podcast, a way for me to tell you if there's been any updates on any cases and just provide you with some new True Crime Army news. Signing up is simple. Just find the link in my show notes and it takes literally three seconds. If you've already signed up, so if I've reached out to you or you reached out to me saying, sign me up, there's no need for you to go there today. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, then just find the link in my show notes. I also dropped the link in my Facebook group, so you can find it on there as well. And you can also just go and sign up for the True Crime Army Bulletin on my website if that's easier. It's militarymurderpodcast.com. Super simple. Just sign up and listen, you can get part three right now. Waiting a week is for the birds. As always, you can find me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast, on Facebook at Military True Crime, and on Twitter at Military Murder. A few shout outs from my listeners who left reviews. Jeffrey on Apple says, quote, I watch TV shows that provide me with not only the story, but obviously visual data to help me get the full picture. Margot does a great job of making her podcast come alive, and I'm able to see what she's saying while I drive 45 minutes each way to and from work. I sometimes sit in my driveway to allow the story to be over. The content is great and the production is wonderful. Great podcast and I look forward to each episode as it rolls out, end quote. Thank you so much, Jeff. So Jeff is a military retiree and it means the world to me when folks from the military community leaves reviews like this, like this next one. Why R. Carter says, quote, absolutely love the podcast. And I feel like the host is so detailed with her telling of each story. I'm a military spouse and this podcast was recommended on the spouse page of my husband's base. So glad I came across it, end quote. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much, Why R. Carter, for this review. And you see, guys, word of mouth is the best. If you're on a Facebook group or some sort of group and you're a faithful listener to Military Murder, don't be afraid to share your true crime obsession with your friends on these groups. Tell everyone you know about military murder. They will probably not be disappointed. I hope. <laughs> okay, so Ashley C says, quote, not only is the host extremely personable, I love her side commentary. She's doing amazing, subscribed maybe a week ago, and I've been addicted since. Please keep up the great work. What you're doing is working, end quote. Ashley, you're making me blush, girl. Thank you so much for subscribing and don't worry. My commentary won't stop. I just can't help myself. You guys don't know this, but this podcast is literally my true crime therapy and therapy in general. <laughs> okay, one more. And this one is from Facebook. Jenna D says, quote, hooked. And I shared with my clients and they're hooked too, end quote. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you so much for being my spokeswoman. One of many. You all make Mama Margot so proud. All right. Thank you so much, True Crime Army. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions, produced by my ever faithful listeners, Brianna from Sutton Knits and Joe from New Zealand. And all of the music was created by Tie Ops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you the conclusion of the BTK story next week. Shh. 
Let's put another podcast.